Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is October 1st, 2021, and I am so thrilled to be joined in my studio again, just like last week, by my dear friend, Mindy Caldwell. Hey, Mindy. Hi, John. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. So good to have you. Thank you. So fun to be here. For those of you who weren't able to join us last week, we did a full hour or no three hours on mm -hmm. the Mormon influence on Chad and Lori Daybell. Again, for those of you who haven't been following this story in the news, there is a whole very significant global news story about the murder of several people, several adults and children that we'll be providing a quick overview about today. But it involves two important suspects, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, both of whom were active and believing members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon Church. And the whole purpose of this two or potentially three-part mm -hmm. series is to address the question of whether or not there were, were these just murders that would have happened anywhere under any cultural or religious context? Or is it possible that uh, beliefs and or doctrines and or practices and or cultural dynamics within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints of the Mormon Church were important factors in the events that lead up to these murders? And we are doing part two of this series today, and we are so thrilled to have with us Dr. John and Lauren from Hidden a True Crime podcast. They are joining us again. They're back and they have an amazing YouTube channel and they're uh, really deep into this, this story. And we're just so thrilled to have them back to help tell the rest of the story. Lauren, why don't we begin with you? Welcome back to Mormon Stories podcast, Lauren. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself again for those who are joining us for the first time? Thank you, John. Yeah, my name uh, is Lauren, as you said, and I used to be a TV reporter for 10 years. I worked with ABC, NBC, and uh, Fox of local affiliates uh, in Salt Lake City and East Idaho and Boise. So that's my work experience, and the journalist in me just uh, couldn't leave. And so once I retired, when my son was a year old, we started a podcast where I can continue being a journalist, and I have delved into this case uh, fully for the past, since December of 2019, I have been invested. Yeah. Tell, tell us about your podcast, your YouTube channel podcast really quick. Our podcast is Hidden, a true crime podcast. It's on all platforms and our YouTube channel is Hidden True Crime. We started the podcast because I'll let my, my co-host and husband introduce himself, but Dr. John is a forensic psychologist and we wanted to understand the why. And we wanted to understand the why because I kept asking the why to my husband, to John. I kept saying, why, how? Why, we what? delve into what? the what? hidden motives. So hidden is the hidden motives, not just sex, love, money, not the dateline motives, but the actual hidden motives of how two people could then do something so horrendous and create such havoc. And that is what our podcast tackles. I love it. Great. Welcome back, Lauren. It's great to have you. And Dr. John, tell us a bit about your awesome background and why you care about this case. Um, so uh, my name is Dr. John Mathias. I am a clinical and forensic psychologist. I've been doing forensic work for over 20 years now. I've done hundreds of forensic evaluations over the years, assessing sex offenders and violence and murders. And more recently, I've been doing a lot of expert witness work. Um, but why did why were we interested in this case? I, I mean, I, I think this case had so many elements and so many variables that 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 were really challenging and um, that people were were very confused by. And so um, I think we we thought maybe we could illuminate some of the pieces of the puzzle and and help make sense of it. And um, you know, I feel like all of my training kind of led me to this point. Right, this is like the Mount Everest of forensic work. So um, it, it was a challenge for me and 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 Lauren, I think, and we, we wanted to take it on. And um, with the with the quarantine during the pandemic, we actually had the time. So we, we talked about a podcast for many years, but we never actually did it because we were so busy with other projects. And, um, you know, prisons and jails shut down in the spring of, of 2020. 
because of the pandemic. So I, I literally didn't have work for months and, um, we finally had this window to, to do this podcast. So, um, so we were really thrilled to take it on. And, you know, I, I joked with Lauren, I said, you know, if, if, if my mom listens and we have one listener, I'll be content. Um, <laughs> but we, we've grown beyond that and we're grateful for that. And we're very, I'm very humbled by this whole experience and, um, we're very happy to be here with you, John and Mindy. Thank you for having us. One thing I want to mention too really quickly is through the process, we've gotten to know a lot of the victims, the victims who are still alive, and it's become really personal to us now. It's um, something that started us wanting to understand the whys, and now it's something that we're really passionate about. We are friends with the victims. We talk to the victims, and... Uh, we care and we hope that we can bring awareness to this and stop something, you know, like this from ever happening again, because we both acknowledge that this could happen again. There's still elements of, of these groups that continue to this day. And um, we're obviously concerned about that. But yeah, it, it did become, thanks for mentioning that, Lauren, it did become very personal. We never anticipated that uh, our have brought enough appeal so that the some of the major players and families would would contact us and reach out to us and want to provide information and be a part of it. So we're really, we were really um, a little bit surprised by that and and grateful too. So it allowed us to really get you know to do a deep dive into this case and get some really outstanding information that that many other people were not getting. We uh thank you thank you both. Um... And, and Mindy, uh, may, maybe if you don't mind, it's it's such a treat to have you here. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself just really quickly again for those who are joining us for the first time. Sure. I'm. My name is Mindy Caldwell. I am a good friend of John and Margie. And at some point, I mentioned to John how interested I was in this case, um, not only because I just find, you know, true crime fascinating, but because this case is, you know, unique and has... Um, has obviously the Mormon element. And I also have, um, I have a little bit of a family history of um, family members who were very involved in this kind of uh, end, end times prepper movement to the tune of, um, you know, investing a lot of, a lot of money and causing some strain and some relationships over this involvement. And so this case has been interesting for me in that way. And also I'm a mom and I, I have several children and, and I've just felt so tender about, you know, about this case and um, about those, about JJ and Tylee and, and all of the victims, um, Tammy and Charles. And, and it's just, it's been such an interesting and sad and fascinating case. And I just haven't been able to look away. So here I am. <laughs> and of course, we talked about the Caldwell takeover of Mormon Stories podcast. <laughs> Uh, yeah. we, your husband, Steve, came on Mormon Stories a few weeks ago to talk about the vaccine. That's right. And uh, Shannon Caldwell Montez is, yes. is Steve's sister. And of course, she did that incredible series on BH which Roberts. we shared, Which we shared with John. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're like, yeah. you have to read this. Yeah. Uh, not so much that she's our sister-in-law because it's really good. It's, there's, it's important. So I'm yeah, glad. I love that. it. Thank well, you. welcome, Mindy. It's great to Thank have you. Thank you. Um, really quickly, uh, I... I think we ended last episode by talking about, by naming uh, the the victims, uh, the actual murder victims. Why don't we start by naming them just so that we, sh and we'll come back and we'll end by talking about them as well. But should we just name the, the victim? When she was murdered and JJ was just seven years old when he was murdered and they were brother and sister. They were Lori Vallow Daybell's children. In addition to these two lives lost, Chad Daybell's wife, Tammy Daybell, uh, is what died in October, um, shortly after the children died. And Chad Daybell has been charged in her murder. And then Charles Vallow, who lived in Arizona, so separate state, that was Lori's husband before Chad. And he was shot multiple times in a so-and-so self-defense, but recently Lori Vallow has been charged in his murder as well. So that's just the beginning. And then there are questions of other people. Chad's, Chad's, did you mention Chad's wife, Tammy? 
Chad's yes. wife, Tammy. Yes. Okay. Mentioned okay. her and he's been charged in her murder. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, it's, uh, it, it's always tricky to, um, it's always tricky to follow these crimes because they're so fascinating, but right. you, but you don't want to get all giddy and about the joy of the fact that actually people have been killed and, it's yeah. real, right? Real lives and real yeah. victims, yeah. right? So, Absolutely. That's important. Like and we have our bracelets on today too. Justice for JJ and Tylee. Yep. All right. So just to just do like a 30 second recap last week, we talked about what we felt are the Christian foundations for um, everything that's happened, including a belief in God and Jesus and the second coming and, and the 144,000 and a belief in spirits and souls and devils and demonic possession, prayer, heaven, prophets, spiritual gifts. All of this is Christian doctrine that uh, under underlies this case. And of course, we talked about various Mormon beliefs that, that heavily belie this case as well, including an emphasis on personal revelation, uh, an extra emphasis on the second coming, um, the prepper movement uh, that that was rooted in food storage. There are even scriptures in Mormonism about uh, one mighty and strong or a Davidic servant that will come back and usher in Jesus's return at right before the second coming. Uh, the Mormon plan of salvation that teaches about past lives and future lives. We'll be talking about that today, as well as this notion of the veil or the veil of forgetfulness where we were, um, a veil was put up to help us forget our, our past life or to keep us from seeing into the future lives, spiritual gifts, even the use of like magic relics, like stone, Joseph Smith's use of a stone and a hat to, um, you know, translate the book of Mormon. And then of course we have, you know, blessings and healings and special spiritual powers. And even women who feel like they maybe have lost, their spiritual powers, and then, of course, just a really important de-emphasis on, on science and evidence and critical thinking skills, heavy sexual shame, uh, the teachings of polygamy and polyandry, which are uh, going to weigh into today's episode that come from Joseph Smith himself, along with the teachings of celestial ceilings and eternal marriage, becoming gods and goddesses. All of that is very Mormon, um, along with the strong conservative Republican Mormon culture in eastern, uh, in rural Utah and Idaho, and specifically eastern Idaho. We we talked last week about Denver Snuffer, near, near death experiences, and Julie Rowe. I called it neo Mormon fundamentalism. Uh, it's not quite Warren Jeff's Mormon fundamentalism, but there's a emerging internet based neo Mormon fundamentalism that uh, is rooted in prophecies and near death experiences and just as you mentioned, Mindy, kind of this, this sense for more Orthodox Mormons that they're just getting milk all the time. They're not yep. getting enough spiritual meat and that they need more spiritual sustenance, which makes them become seekers. We talked about, um, we also talked about, uh, mm -hmm. let's see so many video clips we, we showed, mm -hmm. but we talked about, um, Julie Rowe. We talked about Chad Daybell. We talked about him becoming an author and going into book publishing. Um, and then we talked about uh, the prepper movement and uh, a vow and the preparing of people. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of what we talked about. We really do recommend that you guys go back and watch that. Um, and what we're going to begin with today is, is a disclaimer. And maybe, Dr. John, you might feel comfortable providing a quick disclaimer before we jump in. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think it's important to to say we didn't really say it last episode strongly enough, but um, that it's it's important to remember that that Chad and Lori are innocent until proven guilty. So this case has not been adjudicated. Um, sometimes I think you know because the evidence is overwhelming, we make a lot of assumptions. But but chad and Lori both will have their day in court and the case eventually will be adjudicated and tried and so um as strong as our opinions may be the fact is that at the moment that, that they're they're innocent until proven guilty and i think it's important to keep that in mind um and with that in mind i think there's another disclaimer which is that this is speculative um 
you know, so we're developing theories of the case, or at least I am. Um, and, um, and I want to say it's, it's very educational. It's more educational than, um, otherwise I think than, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to provide information. We're not trying to make judgments. We're not trying to prejudge the situation. Um, but we're looking at the evidence and, um, certainly we're making assumptions, but, um, but we're speculating, um, and we're hoping to educate people. I love it. Very good. Okay. Well, I think the first place to begin today's episode, and by the way, if you guys are viewers or listeners, sometimes people love the introductions and the, you know, the, you know, the, the beginning parts. And some people just want to skip to either just getting into the meat of things or just jump to different parts of the episode. I want to make sure people understand that if you consume our podcast on YouTube, what we try and always do within a day or two of releasing the episode is provide time code stamps where you can literally, if you want to just skip all that intro and jump to part one, you can click on the time code that jumps you there and you can actually read the different parts that we ended up discussing on the, the video and jump to the parts you want to jump to. And, and, you know, if you're a podcast listener, you can always uh, buy YouTube premium, which I think is like 10 bucks a month that takes out all the ads and it makes it so you can listen on YouTube and even have your screen turned off. And uh, I think that's the way I consume a lot of content these yeah. days. So point. I just I just wanted to kind of make people aware that both the time codes are available to jump to where they want to go. And that, that consuming podcasts through YouTube, even if you just listen in audio, YouTube is becoming a great way to consume. But we also want to make this friendly to our audio-only listeners because that's the bulk of our audience. Okay, so let's begin. We we introduced Chad and Julie, and I think the next step is to talk about Chad hooking up with Julie and Chad becoming her publisher. And uh, we we've got a couple of videos queued, but but Lauren and Dr. John, where should we begin the story? I think that this is important. I think that when Chad and Julie connected, it was it was huge. Uh, we even received an email just last week that said that once Chad became Julie Rose publisher, uh, he was able to take all his children to a restaurant for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, or they were excited about being able to go to a restaurant. Uh, someone wrote us who knows the Daybells and a lot of the other players. And she said that was something the children were thrilled about. So Julie made a big difference in Chad's uh, financial life as, as well as, some other things that we'll learn about. Dr. John, you want to say anything? Yeah. You know, I, th I think this is a pivotal moment and, and the more we learn about this case, the more important it Julie Rowe's influence is, I think in the sense that she really paved the way for Chad to begin kind of reinventing his past in terms of the near death experiences. He really hadn't talked about near death experiences until after Julie Rowe. So he saw how successful she was with the book on near-death experiences. Uh, he saw the importance of that. He saw the authority it provided to her. And I think he sort of re engaged in some revisionist history that, that allowed him to then claim some of these past incidents were near-death experiences. One of, the things, one of the things I love about uh, your, your YouTube channel, Hidden a True Crime Podcast, and your podcast is that – you mentioned, and I think we talked about this last week, you mentioned Chad's longtime career as a great, literally a grave digger where he was digging graves and burying dead bodies. Clearly that's relevant, at least for two reasons. One is this very close direct association with death, death. over a long mm -hmm. period of time and mm -hmm. dealing with bodies, but also it just shows how poor and sort of un, unremarkable maybe his life had turned out to be, which then when the money and the fame starts coming, certainly he doesn't want to let that go. Is that Dr. John, what do you think about that? Yeah, th those are, thank you for summarizing it. Those are great insights. And I, I would take it a step further and say, there's a, a theory that's in um, social psychology called terror management theory, which we talk about on the podcast. But the basic idea is that death anxiety drives us to more extreme behaviors. And since Chad was around death all the time, I believe quite strongly that, those experiences, as you mentioned, John, tended to um, to lead to more extreme beliefs. 
So it, this wasn't something that was conscious. He wasn't consciously doing this, but the fact that he was around death all the time, I think really kind of ramped up his beliefs in a more extreme direction. Um, and it, it, it gave, he, he, he became more invested, I think in his writings and his beliefs and his visions for the future. Um, in addition to what you just said, that I, I think you're right. I think that there were some midlife issues, midlife crises going on, and, and working in a cemetery certainly wasn't what he envisioned um, for his life. He didn't feel particularly successful, I'm sure, although I'm not sure he would admit that. But um, but absolutely, it was a stark contrast, I think, to this vision he had of being really influential in the Mormon world and writing books that were taken seriously by the church um, none of which was happening. He never became a bishop, which I'm sure was really disappointing to him um, in Springville. So I think there were a lot of failures that 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 were going on behind the scenes that that kind of underlay his work in a cemetery um, that, as you said, John, kind of created this um, the sense of failure and um, this midlife crisis. Love it. Okay, so Julie had these books. She, she kind of got this reputation of being an energy healer. She publishes some books about near-death experiences and her ability to prophesy and forecast, um, you know, natural disasters and things in the future, kind of end times prophecies by a Mormon woman. Chad hooks up with her as her publisher. Um, should, should, is there anything else we should say to set this up before we play a few of these clips? I say we play them. Okay. Yeah, let's go for it. So here's the first clip that is kind of interesting. It's basically Eric Smith, which is a... Mindy, do you want to introduce Eric Smith? Yeah, or? maybe we should introduce Eric Smith yeah. <laughs> before we okay. get into that. So Lauren, do you want go to go ahead, first? And, and then Mindy can fill in her impressions of Eric? because Absolutely. I, I, like Eric I, first, I first learned about Eric Smith in December of 2019 when... Mm -hmm. There was a podcast. He and Julie Rowe had a podcast together and they did a podcast in December of 2019, right after the story broke. And the only thing we knew at the beginning was two missing children, a desert book author and a once primary president are being looked at and there are two missing children and what in the world. And so right after that story broke, it was the day after Christmas, 2019, Eric Smith and Julie Rowe jump on a podcast and announce that essentially Julie announces that Chad is innocent and she knows his heart. And I have been so intrigued with Eric Smith ever since. And they, they did these podcasts together. It was, it's called eyes wide open. And since that time I have interviewed other people that knew Eric Smith and Julie Rowe. I learned just how tight knit this group was. And Eric even allowed me to interview him, which I know we'll get into later. But Eric Smith is somebody that is a big believer in Julie Rowe, a big uh, person in the uh, prepper movement in East Idaho, and someone that started, and he he's uh, essentially the belief of uh, multiple probations or reincarnation. Anything else you want to add good. about why Eric's interesting? I think that that, that covers it. Okay. I okay. found it fascinating that I hadn't really heard of him, but he's, he's a pretty major player in this movement and this uh, development of this kind of theology that, that Chad adopts and runs with. He's a very major player. Yes. All right. So this is, this is a clip of Eric Smith talking about Chad's gifts. For me, it was one of the most powerful and impactful uh, parts of this entire interview. I think I want to do a, um, a reaction video with Mindy as maybe a part three to the series where we just play this amazing two hour interview that you, you Lauren did with Eric Smith, because to me, it really explains Joseph Smith. If you look at er Eric Smith's beliefs in Chad Daybell's powers, it explains how people could believe in Joseph Smith, even after he never found any treasure even after the polygamy, even after all the problems, you've still got all these people believing in Joseph Smith after the Kirtland Bank scandal. Mm -hmm. How can you still believe in someone when there's so many problems? This is Eric Smith talking about his continued belief in Chad's powers after Chad Angelina. is now mm -hmm. in prison for, uh, for accused murder, right? Right, right. 
And so this is this is Eric reflecting on his belief in Chad's gifts. All right. And and I'm going to just ask Lauren, Dr. John and Mindy, you guys tell me to stop the video when you think uh, we've seen enough because you guys know this video better than me. Is that OK? OK, so this is Eric Smith reflecting on Chad Daybell's gifts. He, yeah, so he's, he's became so curious and I think he did recognize, and I'll be honest, I think he does, Chad is gifted. There is no denying it. Okay. And anybody who says otherwise is, is, is probably not being truthful with themselves. People are spiritually gifted. I believe all of us have spiritual gifts and mo a lot of people are empathic and can read people's energy and hearts. And, you know, Chad had some of that. Chad. How is he gifted? How is he gifted? <laughs> Well, he had a thin veil. He he could see and discern things on the other side of the veil. He could see energies. Um, the the thing that I have learned, and I've been around a lot of say gifted people in this way, in the visionary aspect, um, knowing discerning things on the other side of the veil. Julie's has exceptional gifts, um, and then I've met several others that are the same, that are visionary, see things, discern things on the other side of the veil, um, see spirits, talk to spirits, feel their energy, even smell them. Their senses are just different than most of us. And I'm totally comfortable with that. The thing that That's I good. learned is that with these folks, they... Okay, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that the audience could hear that video okay. Um, we could hear it. I could hear that great. Okay, great. Great. So Lauren and Dr. John and Mindy, what do you guys reflect on what we just heard about Eric Smith's belief in Chad Daybell's powers? I, when interviewing him, I was surprised when he said that, which is why I think I interrupted him and said, what are his powers? I wanted to really understand what he was sharing with me. And when he said he, he can see beyond the veil, that's exactly what Chad's always claimed he can do. And it was... It was surprising for me to hear that after this is after they've been charged with these deaths, like let's right. put that into perspective and Eric believes that Chad did it. So put that in perspective too. Eric believes that Chad is responsible, that his ego got in the way and Chad has been charged officially by law enforcement in this crime. And he's saying that, no, he can. He can see beyond the veil. The issue is ego, but that doesn't mean his gifts aren't real. That was um, surprising for me to hear. And, and I just, yeah. I, I have to jump in here. Uh, you know, my role in this whole episode is kind of making the connections that I can make between this story and Mormonism. And if you study the life of Joseph Smith, um, you know, one of the things apologists say when they're, you know, you if you mention that Joseph Smith took people on treasure digs with a stone and a hat, but never found any treasure. If you mention um, the Kirtland Bank scandal, if you mention the polygamy, the 30, 40 wives hiding it from Emma, all the deception, and then his martyrdom. When you mention that to Mormon apologists, what they say is, well, how do you explain that so many people still believed in Joseph Smith, even after he was you know, put in, you know, uh, persecuted for treasure digging, they still believe that he had the power to treasure dig. Um, even after his martyrdom, look at, you know, 16 million people, they will say, still believe in Joseph Smith. That's evidence that Joseph Smith was still a prophet because how else could so many people believe in him? Well, you don't have to just go to, you know, David Koresh or Jim Jones or, you know, any modern cult leader to, to realize that lots of people still believe in lots of cult leaders in spite of the horrendous things you do. You could also go to Eric Smith and Chad Daybell, even, and I'm driving, I'm, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. Mm -hmm. Even after Chad Daybell had murdered people, Eric Smith is still believing that he had the gifts and powers of God. And not just that, but if we deny it, then we're not being honest with ourselves. You know, <laughs> that, that segment of the interview is just, kind of made me sick to my stomach because like you say, this is way after the discovery of, of those children and, and, you know, all the things are coming together and Eric is very aware of the witness or of the evidence that looks very unfavorable, favorably towards Chad and is still, I just felt like there was a, a void of feeling or uh, emotion for the victims. And he still was trying to press home this idea that Chad and Julie 
you know, still have these, these tremendous gifts. So it's powerful that they have that mind frame for sure. I want to say this too, in this, as you point out, it's a two hour interview and, and some people I see, you know, probably wanted you to keep playing the part you were playing. I apologize. <laughs> but Eric did show some humility too. I brought up this 2019 podcast with him where Julie was stating that you know, he was innocent and Eric admitted, you know, I wanted to believe he was innocent and I was wrong. So Eric was showing some bits of, yeah, you know, I, I should have seen it differently yeah. back then. And yet even then he's like, no, Chad is gifted though. He does see beyond the veil that I'm not going to like maybe waver from at all. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting too. Yes. I want to thank our, our viewer, Sean Bennington. I think I said Chad murdered yes. people and Sean says allegedly murdered people. Allegedly, and, yes. And That's yeah, important. we thank you listeners and viewers for, for those corrections. Allegedly. Yeah. Um, Richard, John. yeah, let me, let me just weigh in a little bit on this issue too. Um, I think I, I, I kind of agree with you here, John, in terms of the issue to me is, is how do human beings evaluate evidence? You know, how is it possible that someone can evaluate the evidence here in the way that Eric Smith does after, you know, Chad and Julie, for example, made a number of prophecies. Not a single one of those prophecies yeah. have come true. Not one. How, how do you give somebody credibility when not a, in 2015, Julie was talking about the Wasatch earthquakes repeatedly and how horrible it was going to be. And none of it came true. You would think at that point there might be a max exodus from her movement, right? But no, she grew. And, you know, I think people filter information through their beliefs, through their worldviews. And if their worldviews are strong and extreme, it's unlikely they're going to change that. Um, and also we know that in terms of like conspiracies, for example, if you take the QAnon conspiracy, we know that the two biggest elements in terms of, of getting people on board with conspiracies are fear and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So you have to think that to some degree, uh, the followers of these folks were influenced by a certain amount of fear and uncertainty that if there's uncertainty in the world, they want to uh, correct that they want to amend it and make sure that their views are correct. And so I think, I think some of those elements are driving this, but it, it really is a fascinating look at, at how we evaluate evidence um, one way or the other um, and how we're willing to stick to evidence that clearly is wrong or false. I'm, I got an interesting comment from Tina on YouTube. She writes, if someone has spiritual gifts and does horrible things, that is bad, really bad. And what I'm reading from Tina's comment is she's, what what is the common response to both Julie Rowe, which we're going to get into later, and Chad Daybell and Joseph Smith, frankly, which is, well, Someone can still have spiritual gifts and then make mistakes later, but that doesn't take away the fact that they have spiritual gifts. And I just, you know, and, th and this is true, you know, Orthodox or mainstream members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will, will make the same argument that, well, prophets, seers, and revelators can still be prophets, but then get wrong, get something wrong, Anything's like wrong. blacks mm -hmm. in the priesthood right. or polygamy. Right. But it really does beg the question, what's the value of a prophet or a seer or revelator or a if, visionary. If you if if right. if you can flip a coin as to their reliability, mm -hmm. um, and if they get it right, well then they're a prophet. But if they get it wrong, well then they're it's they're they're human. It just starts yeah. the question of how much reliability really is there yeah. and what's their value. Because I could get it wrong or get it right fifty or forty percent of the time, and and uh, or a you know a a you know a primate could so anyway <laughs> let's go ahead and jump to, if it's okay to the next uh little video which is julie talking about her relationship with chad and kind of how they hooked up and then i want you guys to kind of paint the picture of what it was like at these conferences these preparing a people conferences in terms of like julie and chad and books and money and presentations and how that led to Julie's energy work, and then what was kind of going on behind the scenes of how Chad and Julie's relationship grew. But we'll start with just Julie describing her her uh, union with with Chad. Headlines around the world, Gretchen. 
Well, Mark, Rose says she was really good friends with Chad and Chad's late wife, Tammy, who died back in October. But since all of these deaths connected to the case have come to light, she says her former friend isn't the man she thought he was. Julie Rowe lives in Kansas, but she travels the country to do what she calls spiritual and energy readings. Like Chad, Julie says she's had near-death experiences and writes about them. That's how she met Chad several years ago. He was my publisher for my first four books. Rose says she also became close friends with Chad, his late wife Tammy, and their children. I did energy sessions for he and some of his kids. Rose says that Chad often spoke with her about his visions of Tammy dying. He really felt like she was going to pass away last fall, last between like October and December. And told her that the two were having problems. He had told me in February, one of the other things he put in the text was that he and Tammy were tied on money and he was doing his best to keep his marriage together. Rose says her relationship with Chad soured last year over publishing rights. Chad cut off all communication with her, but she remained close with his kids. And when Tammy died in October of 2019, Rose says the couple's daughter, Emma, called her. Emma answered her phone and she was sobbing. And we had a 40-minute conversation. I believe that he has done some brainwashing with them. I believe he's still using them. Rose says she never met Lori or Lori's children, JJ and Tylee, but believes it's incredibly selfish how Chad and his new wife have been acting. Chad's kids were left for the holidays after their mom just died with their dad taken off to Hawaii with another woman. They have to see pictures of him getting married on the beach, holding hands while they're stuck in Idaho with the FBI raiding them and police storming their houses and their records and their personal lives. And he's MIA in Hawaii. I think that gives a, a pretty decent sense for their relationship. But but Lauren and, and Dr. John, what did this union of Julie and Chad mean in terms of not just their individual lives, but then what it what it contributed to the growing movement of preppers, but then also uh what 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 came after that? Does that make sense? Yeah, do you want to start, John, Dr. John, or do you want? Um, maybe you, you can take that. Okay. So well, it's I a think... bunch of preppers. It's a bunch of Mormon preppers right. that are thinking about the end times and buying ammo and buying food and buying MREs and tents. We've got that foundation of a bunch of Mormon preppers. What does what does Chad and Julie entering the mix do in the movement and to their individual lives? That's the question. Okay. Well, one thing that um, Eric Smith brought up in the interview with me was these three different tiers. Can I begin there a little bit? Does that work? Yeah, sure. um, so there, he explained that there, the tier one is Mormonism, mainstream Mormonism. Tier two is where Eric took it. He believes in multiple probations, reincarnation, um, which he considers a beautiful belief system in the hereafter, uh, as well as a few other things. Tier three is where uh, he mentions Perfect little, yeah, thank you. He mentions um, zombies are tier three. This is Chad. This is what Eric Smith is claiming Chad's belief system is. Just define infidelity, prophesying murders, evil, dark, a rating system. But but I want to say, and, and then Eric Smith, who is a believer in Julie Rowe and, and was good friends with Julie Rowe, did this podcast with Julie Rowe. In fact, there was a picture of Chad and Julie in that, that newscast that you showed there with her mouth open. They cut off Eric Smith on the left side. So, you know, so Eric Smith is uh, saying that this was Chad's, but I have to say, no, this was Chad and Julie's. Chad and Julie went house to house with a pendulum telling people who they were in past lives, rating people light and dark. They would, they would correlate with each other on their spiritual gifts. They both could see beyond the veil. Chad's veil was ripped. And so uh, Julie's was fully open to the, they would uh, hear things and confirm things. And they, when I see tier three, I just want to say, I see Julie Rowe in every, one of those things in, in my opinion. And I just think it took this prepper movement to a whole, whole new level. In addition to this, they're still doing the prepping movement. Julie is asking people to deed their property to her for her nonprofit. She's having 2000, you know, two thousands of people come to the, you know, tabernacle in Rexburg to hear her speak 
getting people's, you know, taking people's life savings from them. We you know of three people that have were requested uh, to deed their property to her cause. And so in addition to this, we're getting into these, we can see whether people are light or dark. We know who you were in a past life um, and multiple probation. So, um, and Chad is, has more money, I think at this point too, than he's ever had to. So throw that, you know, yep. tangible thing in too. So let me see if I can summarize. So we've got all these preppers <laughs> largely in like Eastern Idaho, Rexburg, but also in Draper and in Arizona. Sandy and in Arizona, they're all into prepping. But then when in these prepper conferences, Chad and Julie are showing up selling books, speaking, they start to become kind of celebrities within the prepper movement. Yes. And then yes, because, sure. because then they can sell their energy work or they can have private get togethers, which you talk a lot, you know, people that you interview on your uh, YouTube channel slash podcast start talking about this. Chad and Julie start meeting individually in these small groups, right. both in Idaho and in Utah and in Arizona. And they start, you know, they start talking about their longing for more advanced Mormon doctrine. So yes, yes. Mormon theology Yes, Mormon theology, we all have spirits. Yes, we had a previous life and we have an afterlife. Um, but that's kind of milk. That's just boring. Like <laughs> that's we, boring. we learned that in, in elementary school. We learned that in primary. Right. They want the meat. And so what Chad and so uh Eric starts developing this, you know, what we're calling second and third tier theology, which is that. Number one, it's it's marrying this idea of reincarnation with Mormonism. He doesn't like the term reincarnation just because it has negative connotations. But it's this idea that not only are we currently living as spirits, but we lived in previous lives as different spirits. So maybe I was Napoleon Bonaparte, or maybe mm -hmm. you were... Maybe Joan you were of Arc. Joan of Arc, right? Yeah. And and but neither of you were a slave, just so you know. No, that, that's a <laughs> no point. servants in this that group. We, I, we've laughed so hard about this, about about this when this multiple probation uh, movement, you know, um, when they started talking about this, it was very interesting um, how or what people what they were. Uh, telling people that they were in, or who they were telling people that they were in previous probations. Um, and it's, it's almost always, it seemed to be really important, you know, biblical, I think Isaiah, they, Isaiah and Joan like, of Arc. Uh, yes. Like really important. Henry VIII yes. Or, people you know, in, in, in history and biblical and book of Mormon, very important people. Samuel the, the Lamanite. Oh, right? Samuel the Lamanite and Alex Cox, um, who was the, who, who also passed away is another death in this, in this saga, um, That's Julie's he, brother. This yeah. is, no, it's Lori's brother. Lori's brother. Lori's Lori's brother. brother. Um, he was, t he was told by Chad Dayball that he was, um, the angel that came to Nephi in the book of Mormon who protected Nephi when Nephi was getting beat up by his brothers. And so he kind of took on that role. So it's just another illustration of how it was all important people. And we laugh, like it just, how convenient that, that all of these, all of these important, all these Rexburg, really important people came back as like middle-aged white guys in, in Rexburg. <laughs> all these Rexburg, you know? yeah, preppers, yeah. all of a sudden are some of the most important people in in history. Right. So if you if you take Eric's beliefs of multiple probations, and then these this idea of spiritual gifts with with people like Chad and and Julie claiming to have spiritual gifts. They're the ones and others going around to people's homes, telling them like almost like a patriarchal blessing, right. who they were in former lives. So that's kind of one important theological development, um, which then leads to this idea that people like Chad or Julie have the ability to see whether someone's spirit is either light or good or evil and dark. And right. can someone explain if if a spirit is evil and dark, what that means? What does that mean? Dr. John, take that one away. He loves Chad's rating system. <laughs> what that means. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to interpret that, I guess. Um, from a psychological standpoint, which is where I'm always going to begin, um, it's about power. If you have the ability to judge someone lighter, light or dark, then you have power over them. 
So when you combine all the things you're just talking about, John um, and Mindy, uh, you know, the, the multiple probations and all this other stuff, and you combine it with the light and dark system, um, you're putting yourself in a position of authority, of power to really uh, take control of a situation and to judge people and to separate them into basically good and bad. Yeah. And Chad and Julie both did that. And theologically, if somebody, okay, we all have spirits, right? Um, if somebody is evil or dark, what does that mean in terms of what's happened with their spirit? Does that mean that that they've been uh, possessed by evil spirits? And then is that how the zombie thing comes in? Because at some point their actual spirit has left their body. And so evil spirits have taken over their body. And that's what a zombie is. Tell us about how evil and dark connects to zombies. And, and let's not introduce Lori yet or kids, but just talk okay. about the concept. Well, you're in luck because Chad Daybell left us a lot of information on how his rating system worked. He oh, explained yes. that if you're, he uses a decimal point system as well. You, you're usually like a 5.1. Yeah. 5.1, 2.1. He'll tell you how dark or how light, how light you are to a very specific point decimal point system. He explains that, um, there's a lighter dark system. If you are dark, but you're not too dark, you can kind of come back from that and maybe become light. If you, you know, hit up another multiple probation or something, you've got a chance, you know, you're, he's telling you there's a chance for you, but if you are, um, really, really dark, I think it's like 4.1 and beyond, yeah. then there's no coming back. You're pretty much screwed. And Does that mean your spirit's bad or that your spirit's been replaced. Do we know? Well, uh, you I know, know that. <laughs> to, I mean, it, it's it's confusing how it goes from possession, you know, possession to zombies. Uh, what we do know is that they're they talked about the idea of twenty thousand zombies being present in the United States that needed to be eliminated. So yeah. somehow this idea of zombies is important because um, it's part of their calling or their mission to eliminate zombies, and we know that there was a lot of discussion that the number was around 20,000. So that actually raises the question of whether, you know, uh, of to what extent, um, how far could this go? To what extent were, were many people in danger, right? I mean, I don't, we don't know because they, they, they ended it fairly quickly after everybody that was murdered was considered a zombie or alleged, alleged to be murdered. Let's say that, um, <laughs> But we don't know, you know, based on this idea of many, many thousands of zombies, we don't know where this could have gone. We've talked to people that are close to this movement and they say he would have kept going. There would have been many, many more murders. I want to so, say this, too, because a lot of people claim that the zombie thing came out of nowhere and it was right before the murders and zombies is crazy. You know, I don't know where this term came from. First off, the term zombie has been around for a while. There are comments on a vow or a vow that we talked about in our last podcast episode. This is a prepping website with its headquarters out of Rexburg run by uh, Christopher Parrott. And uh, Chad is commenting. We have That's screenshots. Kind of of um, keep going. Sorry. Oh yeah. We have screenshots of comments he made on the avow site and he's asking Christopher Parrott. So when these zombies come in from um, Idaho, li liberal Idaho falls, that's what he was referring to, the liberals. And the liberals start coming towards Rexburg from Idaho Falls. Do we just shoot them? What do we do? You know, and he's, and nobody's. The liberals in Idaho uh, Falls. Yes. Because <laughs> there's a college, like, out of who state university is there or something. Like, what is that Pocatello? I forget. I, mean, I, mean, that's Pocatello. I know Pocatello. Yeah. But, but no, exactly. It's, it's, um, I know that comment's mind blowing on so many levels, but he's referring to shooting zombies. And, um, Essentially, zombies are what is possession in what some people believe is a pet possession, according to Eric Smith, where an evil spirit enters a good spirit. So it's even beyond rating you as a spirit or how evil, and you know, there's the rating system, how light or dark are you? But there's the idea that uh, your spirit, you could have even been a great spirit. You could have been a top spirit, you know, the most light of light, good spirit there is, 
but that doesn't mean that a uh, evil spirit can't enter you somehow. And then we just got to maybe get rid of you and shoot you before you, you know, get to Rexburg. It can, it can enter you. If Chad Daybell says it's entered you. Yes. I also want to bring up this book one more time because I'm learning how important it is. You've brought up Denver snuffer who is so important. And Mindy brought this book up last time. And a lot of people now have said it's by John Pontius. Who's now deceased. He died just before, just after publishing this book, he tells a near death experience of a man who goes by the name of Spencer. And in it, it talks about possession. It talks about portals mm -hmm. and Chad Daybell mentions this book, Lori Daybell, Ballo Daybell loved this book. And I think that this book um, is important too. And if, if you want to understand zombies and the rating system, maybe, you know, head to your local library. Let's hope it's not there, but you know, you can check this out. I was just going to say that 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 book, the reason I mentioned it last time is in my personal experience with with this movement um, and with family members, that book was extremely influential. It was gifted to me, actually, by my family members. So, yeah. So zombies is not just like out of the blue a right. month before the murders by Chad Daybell. It still exists. This idea. Yeah. And just to be clear, well, what we're trying to do is paint the picture. So because of these prepper events, because Chad and and. uh um, Julie becoming celebrities, they're starting these little small groups where they're going around all over the country and meeting with these small groups. And I'm going to share one comment from a, a viewer. Smile Zim says, I was a part of those prepping groups and ate it all up. I was a true believing Mormon back then. I was ashamed at how I ate it up. Now that I'm out of the church, I can now see how easy it was to fall into the BS. And that's the point we're making isn't just that Chad and Julie developed some weird beliefs. It's that they had, because of these events in their books, had these massive followings like Denver Snuffer, where they had thousands and thousands of people all over the Mormon church believing that, that Chad and Julie and even others had these special powers. And I think it's okay if we just play a quick clip that ties back to Joseph Smith. It's basically of Chad you know, using a pendulum. We have, it, to, we have to talk about the pendulum really yeah. fast. Okay. You do you want to, do you want to introduce it, Mindy? Introduce can the I pendulum. Do, can I get this? Can I do this one, guys? <laughs> um, so Chad comes across a necklace, I believe in a, just a, a LDS chapel, correct, Lauren? Correct. While he's cleaning some, the chapel. While he's cleaning some, some young woman or mom lost her necklace at the church. <laughs> Chad finds a necklace and he, um, he claims that the spirit told him that, it, you know, it was it had special powers just for him, and then he he uh, subsequently used that necklace throughout the rest of his, you know, of this practice of like using it to to gauge people's lightness and darkness and and their uh, mortal pro or the pre mortal probation those types of things. So, yeah, it was a pretty special necklace that somebody's missing. And where would Chad get the idea that objects can have <laughs> special powers? Well, Mindy? magical thinking has roots in the very origins of of the LDS Church. So. And, a, and a really good book on and that objects. is is Michael Quinn's Early Mormonism and the Magic, Magic World View, yes, which talks about Joseph Smith owning a Jupiter talisman, about him using a stone in a hat. Mm -hmm. Others use stones, peep stones, with the claims of being able to see spirits to see. Spirits guarding treasures underground. The whole Book of Mormon narrative comes out of this idea of a, of a treasure buried in the ground, yep. golden plates, yep. with an angel guarding it, Moroni, and Joseph Smith being able to see all this through a stone and a hat. Right. So Chad is basically just saying, and again, Dr. John, you brought this really important point up both today and last time. If you're going to want power over people, mm -hmm. you need to claim to have special powers. And sometimes right. you need an object Mm -hmm. that you claim helps you have special powers. And the reason why we're bringing up the pendulum isn't to make people look silly. It's to basically, it's to basically introduce that Chad is doing what Joseph Smith did, which is he needs an object to help him appear as though he has more powers so that he can have power over people. And that's right, why we're right. the pendulum to tie to Joseph Smith and to, to explain how Chad gets extra powers. Is that all right? Yeah, and yeah, we do and, believe. And oh, go ahead, John. Not, not to go too far with this, but but, but it, you know, for example, in the Nazi movement, objects, symbols, images, music, all of these things 
can sway people, right? All of these things are you like in the Nazi movement, so many of these types of things were used to influence people and to get them to buy into the movement. And so obviously that was a much more extreme version of this, but same idea. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's go ahead and play a clip and I'll ask uh, Lauren and, and Dr. John and Mindy to tell me when to stop the clip, but this clip talks about Chad's use of a pendulum. Anything else you want to say, Lauren, to set up this clip? Yeah, I, I, I got in touch with this uh, man who I interviewed, Dustin. I think you're playing Dustin's interview. Is that right? right. Yeah, and Dustin Thane. He, his name came out in a, a what we call a document dump that was released. And as someone who was a very special person in a past life, and so we got a hold of him, and uh, he says he was never a believer of Chad, but he had an experience with him, and this is what is called family history, what Chad does. So it's on our YouTube channel. And tell, what is Chad, what are we going to be hearing Chad doing with this pendulum just so that we, that'll help us understand the actual clip better. He comes with another person to uh, this person's house to tell him who he was in a past life. And okay. this is how he did it. And he uses this necklace mm -hmm. as, as a pendulum to do it. Okay, here we go. Here's the clip. A time that um, Chad asked if he could speak with me. He, I mean, we're from the same town. He lives up the road a little bit. An acquaintance, I did not know him well. So he came over with a friend. They asked to, to speak with me away from my wife, which was a little odd. They took me to a place in my house and he began to explain what he had been into and a pendulum and he was asking these questions and he told me what level of light I was and listed all these people that he thought that I was in a, what did you call it, another probation um, anyway, an uncomfortable situation. I sat through it, listened to him and that was about it. He called it family history. Um, I remember a few of the people that he said that I was, which made me very uncomfortable. They told me that I was not to speak to my wife about it and they left. And of course I went straight to my wife about it. That's good. <laughs> but a time that really quickly, um, um, Chad asked if he could speak. So with they're, me. They're, you're scrolling he, on I mean, this video, like Adam and Abraham and John Taylor and John the beloved and Noah remind us why those names are on the screen. <laughs> this was the document dump that I uh, referenced where I found Dustin's name, his, the name the, his name was there as who he was. And what's fascinating again, is this comes from, a law enforcement investigation. When people want to say this has nothing to do with Mormonism, this is what law enforcement had that was released to the public. Chad's family history documents and Destin's name was in there. He did not want publicity. He did not want his face, you know, shown, but he was so kind enough. He was kind enough to do this interview with me to explain how this happened and what Chad did. And it was so enlightening. So these these, this was act, these are actual documents Chad Daybell put together that landed in law enforcement's hands. And so why what is Chad doing with mentioning Enoch and Noah and Abraham? That means I think he's what? trying to figure out who was who in past lives. Yeah, because you've um, got to check that, right? Like if right. I'm if I tell Mindy she was, you know, Joab or some, you know, or or Soraya, I can't go tell somebody else they were Soraya too, right? And so yeah. It, it, if, it, if, it, if, you know, Eric Smith was Isaiah, then we got to make sure nobody else claims. If somebody else claims to be an Isaiah, then there's a problem. So you need some documentation to track who was who <laughs> in former life. Well, and could, honestly, one thing that's interesting about those, the, the documents that you just said, what are they? What are they? We had the same question you did. You look at those and no, there's no, there's no translation. You don't know what the heck they are, but that's how I found Destin's name. What in the world are these? Oh, well, look, there's a name. I'm going to look him up. Okay, he lives in Rexburg. Can you help me out here? Can you help me figure out what these are? Because I have no idea. And so if you rewind it a bit, it does show Destin's name circled. Um, I started with that and who he was. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. John. Oh, Dr. John, did you want to add something? Um, I, I was just going to say that what, what he calls family were family family history is what I would call recruitment. Yeah. I see this as, um, Chad, You're just, your head. I just think it's just him flexing. I think he's just gotten this power that he's just, it's just 
It's going crazy. And what's this don't tell your wife thing? I, mean, I think that that is a really important thing to talk about and was a, th- a common theme when they would get in these small groups, oftentimes away from their spouses, when they would talk about these things and talk about more past probations, a very common theme from Chad and Julie and others in the group was don't tell your spouse about this. There was a lot of division. We've heard this from multiple sources now, and I have multiple interviews explaining it too. Um, So on, on camera and off that Julie Rowe um, specifically loved to divide the spouses. um, And Chad Daybell was clearly doing the same thing. And you're right. This was a recruitment effort. I agree with Dr. John. This was recruitment. Mm -hmm. And by the way, because I want to tie things back to Mormonism, if you study Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy in the Nauvoo time period, there, there were inner circle people that were allowed to know. And, and there were lots of people who were actually high level leaders in the church, like Mm -hmm. William Law or Emma, who weren't in the know. And so where would Chad get the feeling that he had license to hide things from people, even within inner or outer circles. Well, that really literally comes from Joseph Smith. Emma Smith was like the 21st or 22nd wife sealed to mm-hmm. Joseph Smith because right. Joseph Smith hid the first 20 wives from her. Yep. Um, it was only until he got caught that he actually fessed up to Emma that he was practicing polygamy and or adultery, depending on what you think about Joseph Smith. <laughs> and and again, top leaders, of the, there are several top leaders of the Mormon church like Sidney Rigdon, like Oliver Cowdery, like uh, like uh, William Law, that weren't down with polygamy and that weren't, you know, Brigham was cool with it, but there yeah. were lots that weren't. And so, uh, you know, that, that practice of hiding things comes directly from Joseph Smith. And so this is where I think it's a good time to introduce something that was kind of like National Enquirer level scandal w- within this case. You know, th- there's a, there are always discussions in the, in the, you know, let's just say in the active Orthodox Mormon realm or in the po- or in the post-Mormon realm about ethical non-monogamy or, you know, swinging, that sort of thing. And uh, if, if these are just people, if these sort of neo-prepper Mormons in Rexburg are just people after all, <laughs> and you've got a bunch of husbands and wives meeting together without their spouses, I guess if you were just putting on your psychological or mental health hat, you would predict that there would be swinging or polygamy going on. Right. You would predict it. And it turns out that we learn from your amazing investigative work and maybe a few others that you've drawn from as sources. I don't know where you, you do a good job of incorporating other people's work as well. We learned that, in fact, part of this second and third tier theology is that there really was polygamy or polyandry or swinging going on, even with potentially Chad Daybell, um, Julie Rowe, and others. And we've got some clips where where we talk about that. Um, and uh, I, I um, so that's where this idea of celestial Mormon prepper swinging <laughs> comes into play. And it ties into this idea of foot zoning and energy work and multiple probations. And we're going to play a couple of clips, but I just want to set it up of how foot zoning, energy work, and multiple probations leads to polygamy and swinging. Do do, do you guys want me to set that up or do you guys want to set it up? Go for this is all you, John DeLynn. (laughs) So if you, if you believe in energy that, that we have spirits and that, that people like Chad or Julie have special powers to like discern your spirits or to, you know, to help you cure you of trauma, either from this life or past lives. So you need somebody with the special powers, right? But then you need a way to kind of do work on them. And that's where either the Reiki or the foot zoning comes in where you get them to lie down and you're touching their feet. It's becoming more intimate. Right. Yep. which can be a, a, a grooming for, mm-hmm. you know, yep. sexual, you know, um, shenanigans. You're getting them to lie down on the table. Oftentimes their spouse is there. You're working on their feet. You're saying, I feel your spirit. You were Isaiah. You were, you were Marie Antoinette, <laughs> you know, and I was Louis the 16th in a past life. We loved each other. This is just, you know, just continuing our relationship. That we, we, we had, had a, we had right. a bond in a right. prior life. <laughs> You know, we were connected. Right. Um, you you would have met at one of these AVOW or or preparing, preparing a people, people conferences. Mm-hmm. You would have started to feel that sexual tension. 
now now through foot zoning you're telling people about what they were in a past life and then it, and even if you've got the spouse there that starts to groom people for what becomes swinging or polygamy and sometimes the spouses are even in the room right mm -hmm. and so we're going to play a couple of clips that address this and again I'm going to ask Lauren or Dr. John or Mindy to tell me when to stop the clip, okay? So this first clip, Lauren, do you want to set it up of who it is and, and what we're talking about in the first clip? This is uh, this is the clip in your wonderful YouTube channel that that's, that's entitled Julie Rowe, Cult Leader or Spiritual Healer. And I think it's a woman that's being interviewed here. Yeah, this is this is this is the interview that really broke it. This is it. And I'm so grateful that this woman and her husband came forward. We refer to her as girl on fire. It's the girl on fire interview. Mm -hmm. And she and her husband humbly came forward and said, we were taken into Julie Rose cult. It, we're ashamed. We're not happy. Nobody's talking because they don't want to. And we're going to tell you what happened. Uh, to us in the hopes that um, our, you know, other people will come forward too. So I want to commend girl on fire and her husband, Paul, he'll, he'll allow me to say, Paul, she's girl on fire in reference to a podcast she used to have that she's now taken down for coming forward. And, and they are who, who really broke this open. So the characters in what we're about to hear, Julie Rose got this bodyguard, right? Joel Gervine is her main bodyguard. He has a lot. She has a lot of bodyguards, but Joel Gervine, who we hear about, Joel Gervine is the main bodyguard. We're also going to hear Eric Smith's name. I think later on, depending how long we play this video, I'm not totally clear. And then Girl on Fire is an anonymous because she wants to stay anonymous. Her husband is Paul, and I am interviewing both of them. So because Julie Rowe is going to all these conferences and is super prominent. Her bodyguard Paul then no, no Joel. Joel bodyguard Joel, bodyguard Joel. husband yes. Paul bodyguard has, Joel has power and fame because he's associated with Julie. This right. is how this all power works. So now he can go around and groom people for sexual shenanigans or polygamy under the guise of under the guise of energy work or we were married in a previous probation. The and combination so, right. of energy work, foot zoning. And and multiple probations yes. with with and you know because he learned from Julie how to do this discernment how to do this energy work and this foot zoning, and now he's literally a woman. The girl on fire is telling us the story of how Joel groomed her to become his mistress, and he did it partly while while girl on fire's husband, husband Paul, Paul was in the room. <laughs> yes. right? right? Okay. Yes. Here's the clip, and this is so great and disturbing. Okay, sorry. With him and Paul was there. Like we were all in the same room together, and he he's on Paul's feet first, and a little awkward because the guy doing it on a guy's feet, you so know. The guy like, is groomed first. So Paul's like, it was a little awkward, but yeah. it was fine. And then when he got to, I just want to pause that. And so just to be clear, Joel is grooming girl on fire, but he foot zones the husband Paul first, right? To kind of make Paul comfortable. Mm -hmm with Joel touching his wife, right? Yes, that's fair. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, I just, I, it's just so bizarre. Absolutely. Right? All right, we'll continue. My feet, it was, I felt again how I felt in that energy conference. Like I was under some hip, hypnotic state and he was looking at me differently. Like I could just sense it and feel it. But mm -hmm. what do I say at that time? Yeah, I, I could have said, no, you're right. <laughs> but I didn't because I didn't know what was going on. So... Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to be our friends. Like he was supposed to be our friend. And anyway, so I noticed that was going on. Um, he'd use essential oils because that's, you know, what you do when you do foot zoning. You apply essential oils on. Different oils can help with different ailments or you can, yeah, you can pray or bless, bless them to help pray for them. The oils, just like you can do anything, whatever he was doing. It was foot zoning, but in a spiritual sense, manipulation sense, it was using that as a means to get closer to me right? and manipulate me more. I believe that when I was in the energy conference, I think that's when it started. But and and then as he came around, then I noticed different things. But so then they got done 
zoning our feet and he left and then he texted me the next day and was just like hey how you doing from it and I'm like I definitely felt some different things and he's like oh that's good that's good and I'm and some of it had to do with multiple pro- probation stuff of did you <laughs> okay so as this woman was teaching foot zoning she mingled in energy work somehow so not only are you foot zoning and touching the person physically they were trying to do energy work which means getting to your spirit to figure out things is what okay. they were doing tapping into the subconscious yeah, is what yes. somebody would say yes okay from the world but in that sense it's spiritual right right so I knew that he was learning this from this lady. And I asked him when he texted me, I was like, yeah, I feel different. But like, did you find anything out? Like meaning multiple probation stuff or anything about me? Like I obviously at that point I was naive to this stuff. Yeah. People can say like, well, you were dumb. Like I had no idea. This stuff was all new with multiple probations and the way they were teaching energy. Right, right. So I didn't know. So mistakes are made. Yeah, I think that's one yes. thing I want to make clear that a lot of others that were in this group don't want to admit to that there was mistakes made and things that we could have done to change, to, change things. Yeah, to shield or protect ourselves more, but we didn't. And so a uh, us specifically, there's a lot of shame involved with that, right? Because you made a mistake, you sinned, or yeah, you were taken advantage of. And so that's very real, and that's part of the process that we had to go through. But yes, yeah, I also see what you said, taken advantage of. I'm sensing myself a lot of grooming. Yeah, oh, absolutely. A yeah, grooming, a lot, a of, lot of grooming. You to trust them. Uh huh. To put your trust in them. Yeah. This is right. This is good. So I want you to know that I'm seeing. A yes, lot of absolutely. A hundred percent. And so he's like, but there's some things that I learned. Okay. Really quick. I, I like, I like the part where she actually talks about their texting back and forth, but Mindy, mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much to just unpack already. I, we may want to return. Yeah, that story can to be continued. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yes, that's, I don't know if we'll play more clips okay. or if we want to just kind of okay. talk about what happens after that. What, what were your reactions, Mindy, to what you heard? I'm just curious. Like, oh, I mean, I just think it's classic grooming. And I think that uh, Lauren touches on that. Um, I was, I was honest, I was signaling you just with some notes about what's going to happen later on in the conversation. So I wasn't quite sure if we wanted to keep listening to this gripping interview. Well, a couple of things that stuck, <laughs> tell me if this stuck out for you, like just the idea, you know, we talked about the Mormon church, not teaching people, you know, part of this is to what extent is the Mormon church culpable or liable? Like these people have been raised Mormon, right? They've been raised in, in, I was, to distrust science, to distrust evidence, and to believe that people have spiritual gifts and powers. That's all, whether it's patriarchal blessings or priesthood mm-hmm. healings, mm-hmm. like that, you know, or, or psychologists are bad, or evolution's wrong, or global flood and a 6,000-year earth. That's a mindset that you can easily be raised with in mainstream Mormonism. Sure. And so you hear a girl on fire going, I didn't know. Like, he's yeah. just, he's telling me he's got powers and I'm believing him. Yeah. And what can I do? Also, right. Very real. Right. She was so, yeah, she, she and really had no idea. Yeah. And I, I think it's really brave of her to tell that story and to be vulnerable about you know, kind of getting taken by this. But yeah, that that struck me too as she was talking about how she she called it hypnosis, that she felt like she just was hypnotized by him. And I think it was an I think it's an illustration of of women, a lot of women, and maybe in the Mormon framework who just are used to kind of outsourcing their power to other people, to men. And I, maybe that's, you know, kind of how she was um interpreting that, you know. Am I making yeah, sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And tell me if you agree that when I heard her talking about like a hex or brainwashing, mm-hmm. it, it but it almost felt like she was trying because clearly she went on to have an emotional affair yes. with with Paul, with, right? No, with Paul's with, her husband. With Joel. With Joel. With Joel. Yes. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm so bad with, with the bodyguard Joel. So yes. girl, on, girl on fire ends up having an emotional affair with Joel. They they in the video they go on to talk about the text back and forth, like. Clearly, they're just they're kind of hot for each other because they're at these these prepper conferences without their spouses, right. spending time together. They're in these 
you know, little meetings at someone's house without their spouses because their spouses have to watch the kids, right. you know, under the guise of like developing more spiritually, they're spending time together without their spouses getting hot. And mm -hmm. instead of her just saying we were hot for each other and we were without our spouses and we were developing emotional intimacy, it almost seemed like she wanted to say that, that somehow Joel was hexing her with spells yeah. And this goes back to, okay, you can have spiritual gifts and you can either use them in good ways or bad ways. Joel still has spiritual gifts, but in this case, Joel was using them in dark ways instead of yeah. in good ways. Did I get that right or wrong? Or did you yeah. not, not get that? Yeah, I, I would say, I, Dr. John, were you, it sounded like you were going to say something about that. Well, I, I just think she's, she's trying to, I, I, I agree with you guys there. I, I think she's trying to explain away what's happening. Yeah. She's trying to kind of rid herself of agency right mm -hmm. that, exactly. that to cover up for the fact that there maybe there were some some desires there or you know maybe she was feeling something and sh she obviously has to deal with her husband on that issue too so um this is certainly a, an easy way to explain it away is to say that she was hypnotized or she was under a spell or but it's not really owning it well, I want to give her credit though a little bit too like yes. she I believe that she really believes that she's not like trying yeah, when she brings this up. She's not trying to hide something. She's really trying to make sense of right. That's what how happened. she feels. And I can say that because that's how she feels. I can say that because I've also had conversations with her outside yeah. of the interview, and um, she's really also, I think, just trying to process during this interview what happened to her. You know what I mean? I think this is also her still trying to figure it out, you know what I mean? Because of the shame. So, yeah. I, you know, the, the research on hypnosis is pretty clear though. It's not hypnosis that, that changes people. Um, it's, it's their willingness to engage in the fantasies or imaginative elements of hypnosis that matters. But, and the fantasy though, starts with multiple probations too, though, right. you know, like that's yeah. where the grooming comes right. in is, the power over another, this man is Julie Rose bodyguard. Right. Yeah. And, and if you want to keep playing the story, it is long, but I, it's compelling. This is Julie Rose bodyguard. And he's about to come to her and say, no, we were married in a past life. And he stands by it even, you know, with her husband. I wanted to just add really quickly. I think part of the grooming process as well is the, multiple probation talking and kind of on the down low, it seemed like at this point with girl on fire and Paul, like they'd heard about it, but they hadn't really been kind of brought into that inner circle of what was, what's happening. So I think that was part of the grooming process as well as they were anticipating, are we going to be the extra special ones that kind of get to hear about this and get involved and get pulled into this inner circle? And I think that that was, that was part of that grooming where they, yes, it made them a little more ripe to be susceptible to yeah. this. Happening. And it, it, you could argue, or I could argue that it is a form of hypnosis to, to say that you were married in a past life to, to bring in the proba multiple probation part, yeah. especially when it's, when it's novel. And it's manipulation. She's not, yeah. Right. He's not expecting it. So that is, I'm sure that's what she was feeling. That that would be a type of hypnosis in a way. Mm, interesting. So Lauren, I, I I moved off the video, so I lost Fine. the place I was at. Why don't you go ahead and just tell us what they'll when they go to your actual YouTube channel and watch the yes, full interview. They should watch what they'll yes. hear, what will they hear? Yeah, please watch the full interview. Um, and I, and like I said, I have a lot of empathy and compassion for these two that came forward. But uh, she said at that point, Joel came back again, Julie Rose bodyguard, and said, "I know who you were in a past life, and we were married." And she was so confused, and she um, was feeling emotional things towards Joel. So then she thought, "Well, maybe it's true, right?" So again, there's that whole like that she can't even process any romantic feeling because it's all jumbled with, was I married to him? You know, it's all um, confusing to her. And, and they had been followers of Julie Rowe and listening to Julie Rowe for years at this point. And uh, she finally told Paul and Paul called Joel and said, what in the world are you doing? You know, don't ever call me, you know, again. He goes, and he still tried. Joel said, no, I was married to your wife in a past life and this is real and we all can pro we're all going to be married in heaven and we all can procreate with whoever we want. And I was married to girl on fire. 
So suck it up, Paul, you know, because, you know, this is real. And um, Eric Smith and Julie Rowe and others confirmed what uh, he was saying. They That was the end for Girl on Fire and her husband. And, you know, there's more to it. And you can hear it in the interview. Not but, the end of them as a couple, but at the end of them being oh, involved in the movement. Thank you for clarifying that. That was the end of them being in Julie Rowe's um, movement. They, they got closer as a couple, according to them and their, and our, my interview with them and are still members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, and I want to say too, that I reached out to Joel bodyguard of Julie Rowe, and he did send me a statement that is in its entirety on our YouTube channel as well. And he confirms their story and states that, uh, unfortunately it was because he believed that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy and, uh, that it was Julie Rowe that taught him that Joseph Smith really didn't, and the church made that up. So there you go. Hmm. So we have a clip of uh, of Eric Smith basically describing his, uh, you know, the existence of, of you know, I, I, I don't know. What, what would you say, Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know? um, so this is kind of what I was talking about that uh the belief that with because it gets blurry right so in mormon theology we believe in it, you know in mormon theology it's it's eternal families eternal families and so if you throw in multiple probations the eternal families things gets a little you know confusing and so i was asking eric about this and i was also a girl on fire and her husband paul tried to explain it to me as well so how do you how do you combine it, the idea of eternal families with uh, multiple probations and all of these past spouses? Is that a good explanation? Yeah, yeah. Let's just, let's, and you tell me when to stop this clip, okay? Okay. okay. This is the doctor yes. who shared with me. With, this was Eric and Eric Smith, Joel Gervin. Yes, they, they so both they agreed sh- with this. They shared with me that the way that eternal marriage works is that we are all married to each other in heaven. And basically we just decide who we're going to procreate with or have spiritual children with, but we're all married. to each other. A lot of these teachings came from Eric Smith. Right. Well, here's a thought. I mean, that's pretty good. I don't know all the answers. It's not there. This is shared with me. Okay. I mean, Eric goes on to explain it, but, but that's, that's, so was Eric involved in potentially involved in that? Was he married at the time you interviewed him, Lauren? Yes, yes. And he said that his relationship with his wife is now good. Okay. I also asked him about being a past spouse of Julie, which I've heard in a few other things in that interview. You can check it out. Yes, he was. Yeah, and so involved. And so, involved. just to be clear, there are allegations that Chad and Julie had some type of intimate or sexual relationship. And then there's there's all sorts of allegations that Julie had multiple men. This is where the polyandry comes in. Mm-hmm. That Julie was alienating several men from their spouses. Right. And that Julie was potentially sexually involved with with lots of different men. Is that what you understand, Lauren and Dr. John? Absol- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Dr. John? Uh, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> okay. okay. And I'll just make the point that, you know, the, again, there's always a, the whole point of this podcast is how much of this is just what normal humans do. And then how much of this is influenced by Mormonism and the, the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And I just have to say, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. He practiced polyandry. He taught about celestial marriage and eternal marriage. He taught that we all become God someday. And there's this idea, would all of these, you know, Rexburg and and Draper and, and, you know, Mesa Mormons, would they all have just all of a sudden started swinging together as believing Mormons? There's this quote that I think I referenced last time where good people are always going to do bad, good things. You know, there's always going to be good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. To get good people to do bad things, you need religion. And the idea there is, is that it was a belief that, wow, polygamy is scriptural. It's in Doctrine and Covenants 132. Joseph Smith, our founding prophet, practiced it. 
wow, there is the teaching of eternal marriage, but also now there's this teachings of spiritual gifts and revelation and prophecy. And whoa, I'm feeling attracted to these people I'm meeting at these conferences. Mm -hmm. And whoa, I trust their spiritual gifts. And wow, now I'm being told that I was you know, your, your spouse in a prior life. Oh, well, that's what these feelings mean. I think that's how Joseph Smith thinking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Solomon and David and the concubines and the wives. I think Joseph Smith having the old Testament theology in his brain and then interacting with all these women as a powerful man. Mm -hmm. That's how Joseph Smith gets the quote revelation that he's supposed to restore all things. Oops. Oh no. Angel and flaming sword. I have to be a polygamist. Okay. Let me sleep with 30 or 40 different women because God needs me to. That's the same sort of way that Chad and Julie and lots of other people because of the Mormonism, because of the Mormon theology and history, that's how Mormon preppers become swingers. Is that, I mean, people are going to argue or not argue. <laughs> that's the case. Do, do you think that's crazy, Mindy? I mean, you present a compelling argument <laughs> that I think is pretty fair. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel maybe as passionate about it as you do, but I think that it, uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I mean, it, I don't know if I believe it or not. I'm just making. No, case. no, I think it's a, I think it's it, an important um, correlation. Without DNC 132, without Joseph's 40 wives, without a belief in in his, in multiple probations and spirits, yeah. and uh, would it, would this have happened? It it's what it's <laughs> what Joel Gervine blamed it on. Yeah. So when I received my statement from Joel Gervine, which he wanted me to read in its entirety, so I want to emphasize the whole thing is on our YouTube channel because I'm only reading part of it now. He blamed it on the fact that he believed Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yep, uh, interesting. Okay, I think maybe it's time, unless you guys want to go somewhere else, to, to introduce Lori Vallow into the picture. Should we do that? Let's do it. Sure. So, Dr. John, you do a great job of uh, talking about both Chad's background and Lori Vallow's background. What should we introduce about Lori into the picture? And, and and we do have a clip of her recorded testimony where she talks a bit about some of her life that we prepped and staged for this interview. But why don't we start with you guys introducing her a little bit? Sure. So um, I think there's a there's a couple of pieces to introducing Lori. One would be her relationship with Chad. Um, she, as far as we, as, as best as we can tell, she starts reading Chad's books around 2014, 2015. Do you mind just giving a one minute sketch on like her her? I don't yeah. want to be mean and say train wreck of a life before meeting Chad, but like, okay, just give a one minute sketch of her background. So I, I think if you want to understand Lori's background, you have to understand her father, Barry Cox. Um, and the best way maybe to understand Barry Cox is to know that he wrote a book where he argued strongly that the IRS should be abolished. Uh, and not only did he write this book, but he actually filed a lawsuit against the government and believed that the IRS was unconstitutional and should be abolished. Um, in addition to that, he was convicted of tax evasion and had to pay back hundreds of thousands of dollars to the IRS. So that obviously that was before all that. That was before the book. But there's clearly some animosity towards the government uh, and the IRS um, in spite of the fact that he wants to abolish it. So um, and there, there's a lot more on Barry um, that we could talk about. But I, I think if you want to understand the Cox family, that's probably a good place to start because it, it shows his extreme beliefs and it shows that this is not a typical family. I mean, I'm sure most of the listeners out there aren't necessarily big fans of the IRS, but to want to abolish it completely, um, to, you know, to just demolish it, that's, that's another thing altogether. I think there's something, um, you know, there's something a little oppositional about that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so I, I think that's a good place to start, that, that this is not a typical family. If, if the Daybell family was what I called unremarkable, then the Cox family is much more remarkable in the sense that their father is kind of this dominant extreme guy with these extreme beliefs. Uh, and I have to believe that his, his beliefs in the church were also fairly on, you know, on the extreme side. He was also going to preparing a people 
conferences. And um, I think it's fair to generalize from kind of this hatred of the IRS and the government family takes- to, to the family culture, to see that, you know, and to his religious beliefs um, and to how those, those elements of Barry Cox really influenced the family and the family culture. Okay. So she comes from an extremely LDS anti government family, a father who doesn't follow law, you know, or thinks he's above the law. And um, also they all read many near death experience books growing up. I've heard that from a very reliable source. There's also a story out, you know, again, like I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, but to, this kind of provides a little snapshot of, of the of Barry and kind of the family culture, I think since Barry's such a dominant guy, it's really important to understand him in particular. Um, there's a story where uh, Steve Cope, who was married to Barry's daughter Stacy Cox, um, they went through a, a contentious divorce, uh, and there were some custody battles going on. And Barry decided that he would show up. This is actually in a in a. a a victim statement that Steve Cope gave to the police. Um, Barry showed up at his place of employment and he began to quote scripture um, and talk about, you know, Barry told Steve Cope that he had no integrity and he was quoting scripture to him. Uh, And then Steve Cope reminded him that he had just been charged with solicitation of prostitution. (laughs) So uh, I'm sure that irked Barry. He became agitated and he proceeded to, grab Steve's shirt and pin him up against the wall and to try to strangle him. I don't know how far that went. I think there was an assault. Yeah, there was. So, but he was, yeah, he was charged with assault and domestic violence um, before he left. So um, to me, that's a really fascinating story because it combines so many elements. You know, you have the kind of the sanctimonious self-righteous quoting of scripture, and then he assaults someone after being reminded that he solicited prostitutes. So, um, wow. Right. What a, what a, what an interesting, and there's a record of that. I don't know the disposition of any of that, by the way, I don't know. Uh, we can't find the disposition of the prostitution charge. We can't find the disposition on the assault charges. So we don't know what happened. It may have all been dismissed. Um, but, but in, in a really small, you know, nutshell, um, that's, I think that's a really interesting picture of Lori's father. Someone's saying, so it's opinion. It's not opinion. It was in a custody battle document that this happened. That's what we're relaying. And then I want to say that he did spend time in prison for tax evasion and also was charged with practicing law without a law license. So this is Barry Cox. There's plenty of evidence. Barry right. Cox is. But, to add some basics to yeah. it, I want to say, oh, go ahead, babe. Or to add some basics, um, Lori Daybell grew up in this home. In addition to on those custody battle docs, uh, Barry Cox states in a letter to the court that he tries to teach his son-in-law that women are delicate flowers that you need to nourish. So he's quite a misogynist. So he, you know, you know, Lori was raised to be a delicate flower. She was raised in this very dysfunctional home where the law wasn't, um, you know, (laughs) followed. And, and then, um, she was a cheerleader. It was she was supposed to be beautiful, and she'd been married five times. And l- let me just say on the opinion issue. No, uh, there's uh, not knowing the disposition doesn't make it an opinion. We know that there there's a charge of soliciting prostitutes. That's real. There's that's in a police report, and there's a charge of assault and domestic violence against Steve Cope. That's real. That's in writing. Just because uh, we don't just because there wasn't a conviction. That doesn't mean that it's an opinion. It means that there is an actual charge on his record somewhere. So, um, so what I'm hearing so, you guys say is that she grew up in her dad was a piece of work. Whatever the whatever the charges <laughs> are, her, his dad was yeah. her dad was a piece of work. Right. Let me quickly just uh, give a shout out to a couple uh, YouTube viewers. It's just Robbie uh, donated to this program through the super chat. He wrote, "Thank you for all you do. You help so many people." Um, even if they're non-members, you're great. Thanks. Uh, it's just Robbie for that super chat donation on YouTube. And then Tina writes, thank you for what you do. I've been fascinated by Mormon history for many years, just like, 
Uh, Mormon Stories podcast, Hidden a True Crime podcast, is also supported by donor support. So we want to thank everyone who donates to Mormon Stories to make this program possible, including those who are donating right now on the YouTube Super Chat feature. And I also want to encourage people to support Hidden a Crew Crime, Hidden a Crew Crime podcast True crime. as well. <laughs> I'm struggling with the words That's a little bit. That's fine. That's fine. So going back, so so Lori's dad was a piece of work. She grows up as a as a Mormon, as a cheerleader. Um and uh, and you said she was married multiple times. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And do we know why so many times? What what could we say about why she was married so many times? Is that <laughs> just bad luck? Yeah. Is that just bad luck? Is that a reflection of her? I'm sure it had to do with both parties. But um, I think that when you're raised in a home like Lori was raised, there's, I'll say it. So I would say there's probably some personality disorders. There was probably some impulsiveness. Yeah. Um you know, daddy, daddy issues, maybe. Yeah. Think, and she, but go ahead, John. I, I think, um, we, so we talk about this in one of our episodes. There, there's a book by Pressman and Pressman called The Narcissistic Family. Um, and I want to make it clear, I'm not labeling anyone, anyone in the family as a narcissist. They talk about the family culture. So um, I want to stay away from that label in terms of calling anyone that. But um, what they say essentially is that when there's a dominant parent, it could be a... a a mother or father, um, you know, they, they take all the oxygen in the family. And so the other family members have trouble breathing, right? It's like the metaphor of the, the large oak and the acorns that don't get enough sunlight to really grow and kind of spread their wings and become oaks themselves. I think when you have a family culture like this, um, you know, the, the, the father is so dominant that the, the children really aren't getting their needs met and the children are in some ways a reflection of the father or, or at the very least they want the father's adoration at all costs. Um, and that piece, Lori wanting her father's adoration in spite of the fact that the family is really dysfunctional, um, is going to be an important piece in terms of understanding her relationship later with Chad Daybell. Yes. Thank and really you. quickly, let's add, thank you. Thank you, Dr. John and Lauren. Let's just add how these children come into the picture. Is that okay? Because there's multiple spouses and there's, I think there's an adoption. And so can we just talk about the children and yes. Lori? As, yeah. As, as all as three. Well. Yeah. I'll take that. Does that work? All three yeah. children have a different father. There's three Col children, not two. There's a third. Three, the three, there's three children. Colby is still alive. He is, he was the one that was not murdered and he was married and had, a baby girl at the time. So, and she um, was Colby was the child of which husband number what of Lori? Do we even number remember? two? Number two. Number two. Joseph. Number two. Okay. No, not Joseph I'm Ryan. Sorry, I'm sorry. William Longo Lagonia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Colby's from father. husband. No, number no two. child. Yes. No known child from husband number one. Correct. Right. Colby is child from husband number two. Correct. Okay. Yes. Correct. All right. And then the, a divorce and a marriage to Joe Ryan and, uh, Tylee Ryan is uh, from that marriage to Joe. Biological. Biological. Okay. Biological. And then there's a divorce and she marries Charles Vallow. And they have a blended family. He has two sons from a previous marriage. She has her two children and they want a child together. So they adopt JJ, who was Charles Vallow's sister's grandson. So Charles Vallow's sister, okay, who's the biological grandmother of JJ, had custody of her grandson. And Charles came along and said, hey, to, to Kay Woodcock, Lori and I would love to adopt JJ. So to his sister, he said, we would love to adopt your grandchild. Um, you know, JJ, we would love a, fan, a, a son or a child of our own. We would love to do this. And after a while, and that that happened. So JJ's biological grandparents who sounded the alarm, that they're important. The Woodcocks, it's Charles Vallow's sister, but still the grandchild. So that gets a confusing. The mother, grandmother. Okay. Um, I love it. So that's how we got the three kids. And so what talk about Lori's emotional state and maybe her fourth marriage that kind of makes her interested in preppers and NDEs, near-death experiences, that kind of, how does she even, what's, what's going on in her life that leads her to Chad, basically? And how do they get introduced? 
Is that is that okay? Can we go there? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Dr. John, did you want to speak to that or do you want I mean, she was very religious. Very religious. Just um, quickly, Lauren, your is your signal okay? You're you're freezing a little bit. She's okay is for me. She's okay for okay. us. She's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. It may be you guys are coming out of the same home, so there may be a little bit of bandwidth issues for you guys. Right. I do think that Lori internalized all of the marriages and... I mean, that's not the, the Mormon ideal to be married four right, times, right? Right, And just from interviews with, you know, some of her family members, um, I think her brother speculated that um, maybe she was hoping that that maybe her marriage to Chad would kind of redeem her. Uh, because he was like really righteous and she, maybe she felt like a failure because she'd had so many marriages that had ended. But what was she even doing more of the prepper things? Like how did she? Like, I think she was introduced to some of these books and the, the stuff way before she met Chad. Correct, the, the, Lauren? Yes, correct. She was a big fan of Julie Rowe. She read Julie Rowe's book. She started reading Chad's books in 2015, we know. And, and also um, the Denver Snuffers books, right? That she loved Denver Snuffers, a second comforter. Loved it. She okay. she would give it to her friends as gifts. She loved it. She loved Visions of Glory. She mm -hmm. loved it. And for those um, who don't who didn't join us last time, Denver Snuffer is a was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ Lady Saints, served in a stake high council, right. lives right now as an attorney in Sandy, Utah. And he came out with a series of books basically saying the Mormon church, the, the corporate Mormon church is kind of like lagging in semi-apostasy. You can cut out the middleman and have direct visitations with Jesus if you follow me and are righteous enough. So he has several books. Uh, what are the names of at least one of those books? Uh, the Second Comforter is is the specific book that we know Lori read and loved and would give to her friends. And so it's the idea of, hey— you can you can meet Jesus and you don't need the corporate church to be there. So right. And she absolutely it. believed that she had met Jesus without doubt. And then she loved Mike Stroud. Mike Stroud is another one who who uh, he has an altar in his home and he also believes in these visions. They're all visionary. They all believe in the second coming is near. They all have had near death experiences. Those are sort of like kind of the trend. They all believe that you can have your own visions. So Denver Snuffer. Mike Stroud is a very important one that we haven't mentioned yet. John Pontius's visions of glory that I've showed you. Julie Rowe was huge. She she was she was absolutely a huge reader of Julie Rowe, and then started reading Chad's books in 2015, which are also about the second coming. So and we she should, was fully engulfed in this community and these belief systems. And we should probably say, in all fairness, that Denver Snuffer was excommunicated in 2013. So that's the Mormon Church. Basically saying, we don't like some guy saying, cut us out as the middlemen. We don't like some guy saying, you can have a direct relationship with God and Jesus because the church needs you needs to be the intermediary between you and God. And so that's how Denver Snuffer got the ax. And then, and also Julie Mike Stroud. Stroud. Julie Rose has been excommunicated. Mike Stroud, who was once a seminary teacher, has now been excommunicated. Eric Smith's been excommunicated. Julie Rose has been excommunicated. And do you think all these excommunications happen before even Lori Vallow comes on the scene? Or did some of these happen after Lori Vallow comes on the scene? When I say the scene, I mean the prepper preparing a people oh. scene. Denver Snuffer was excommunicated for sure. Not sure timeline of Mike Stroud. Okay. John Pontius never was because he died at publication. Okay. Um, I don't know when, if De if Eric Smith, Julie Rowe well before. Okay. Um, I don't know about Eric Smith. I can't think, I know the date, but I can't think of it. But by this time, there's a bunch of Mormon neo-fundamentalist preppers that are still active in the church. They're in Rexburg. They're in, you know, Draper, mm -hmm. Sandy. They're in Arizona, Mesa. They're all going to these conferences. They're still active believing members, but they're starting to go off the reservation and they're following Denver and Julie and others believing in near death experiences. And the Mormon church is in this pickle because it doesn't want to excommunicate, you know, 10% of its membership in the United States, but also it's, it's, it's cutting off the heads of all these leaders because the church is realizing, man, we're losing liberals and, you know, we're losing people on the left who are learning about the church history and leaving and apostatizing, but we're also get, having all these these un, unapproved, I'll just say crazies uh, from the Mormon I'd be, church's I would be perspective. Careful to, I don't, I'd be careful. Oh, to what, call what should crazies. I say? What should we say? Just, I don't know. 
think what would the Mormon church leaders think of the neo fundamentalists? Just unapproved. Yeah, very unorthodox. Um, outside the correlated approved sources. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Actually, you for that correction. Crazy is yeah. a bad word. Yeah, I, I think thank you. Should. I appreciate that. <laughs> I fist bump. Yeah. So so, but the Mormon Church is feeling like it's losing control on both sides, and this prepper Julie Rowe Dever Snuffer thing is part of it, and that's. But Lori Valla comes into this a believing Temple recommend holding Mormon, and and maybe we can talk about that as a setup to the clip we have. Do you want? And to I it? think yeah, it's, it's important to bring up preparing a people. I just realized that yeah. very important to bring up preparing a people. Preparing a people is run by two LDS, an LDS married couple. They would do these conferences, and it was really just about visionaries and and being just a better Mormon, you know, and it was yeah. all about be better Mormon. Yeah. 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 The better Mormon, right? Like you're all around all these Mormons, you can still be different and better. And they would do, you know, second coming talk, near death experiences. And, and again, the visionary thing. And what would also happen is uh, Lori and her entire family of origin was into these this preparing a people conferences, and they were all over. They were in Arizona, they were in Utah. They would travel. They would have a whole panel of speakers, and so it, it really got the ball rolling for a lot of this. I think is the ability to be able to head to these conferences and feel like you're just enjoying, you know, like a BYU. It's you know, it's like BYU Education Week. You know, there's no difference, and so uh, I think that that's an important part of this too. And Chad was a speaker at these conferences, these preparing to people's Spark conferences. They absolutely gave him a platform. They've now rebranded, by the way, they're still doing it. They're now Latter-day media, mm -hmm. the same, same two people. And Lori would attend these conferences to mm -hmm. enlighten and fulfilled. And so would her parents. And this is, let me, let, but, oh, oh Dr. Dr. John, let me say one quick thing. Yeah, yeah. When I'm living in Logan in Cache Valley in 2013, 14 and 15, there are members of my ward that are attending both the snuffer events and the preparing of people events. There's the, I would say probably every ward or branch in Utah. Along the Wasatch Front. Or definitely along yeah. the Wasatch Front, mm -hmm. all the way down to St. George mm -hmm. and into Arizona oh, and yeah. Idaho. Absolutely. This is every Mormon ward has at least five to 10 to 20 people that are a part of all this at some level. Is that, Minnie, is that your experience? I feel like that's probably fair. Yeah. I think it's yeah, so this is a big deal, yeah. and we're talking historically, retroactively. This was becoming a really big deal, and it still is a big deal. Right. Um, okay, go ahead, Dr. John. Yeah, so, uh, you know, to me, the most important piece is Lori's encounter with Chad's books in 2015. Yes, I agree with you guys that the foundation was set with Denver Snuffer and Julie Rowe, and uh, she was reading all of that stuff, but she was really smitten with Chad Daybell and his mm -hmm. books. And she was creating this fantasy of who this guy was and this world and this vision he was creating. And she was buying into this fantasy. And simultaneous with that, we know from talking to Colby, who's Lori's son, I, I met with Colby for three or four hours and I've talked to him several times since, um, that she also was a huge fan of Twilight, the Twilight series. So when you factor that in, and, and we know that Twilight, by the way, was written by Stephanie Myers, who's a Mormon or was a Mormon. I don't know if she's active. Um, but the basis of Twilight is this eternal love, right? This immortal, eternal love between a human and a vampire. And I think... I think you have Lori creating this fantasy from Chad's books and from Twilight about the perfect person who unfortunately is not the husband she's married to at the time. So I think she's probably growing apart from him and um, she is starting to, to look for maybe not actively, maybe unconsciously someone who can fulfill more of this fantasy that she's been creating. So that to me is kind of the setup to, uh, the preparing of people meeting in October 2018 when she hears Chad speak. She's not just hearing Chad speak. She's attending that speech with this enormous fantasy that she's already created for years since 2015 and with this whole twilight backdrop of, you know, this incredible, intense, eternal love between a vampire and a human, right? So, it, you know, you've got all these elements in place that, 
that seem to, I think, influence her when she steps in front of Chad Daybell for the first time. Good. I love it. We got a we got a comment on here, uh, YouTube viewer. It's just Robbie writes Dr. John with another slam dunk. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and play. We set up a, a little clip of Lori talking. It's it's this little clip about uh, Temple Recommend or something else, right? Should we? Do you guys want to set that clip up and then we'll play it just to give a a sense of Lori's mindset maybe before meeting Chad? Is that okay? Yeah, do, why don't you, wanna, you why don't you me? set it up, Lauren, and I'll, okay. I'll talk about it. This was in October 2018. This is a this is a testimony meeting, but it's not at church. It's a private testimony meeting among private friends who are gathering together to talk about the bigger, better tier two of Mormonism. And so it is in Melanie Gibbs' home. This was Mel, uh, Lori's best friend. And in Melanie Gibbs' home, everyone decided to bear their testimonies. And Lori Daybell's, uh, it was Vallow, excuse me, Lori Vallow at this time, she was still married to Charles, uh, October 2018, was bearing her testimony about why she, you know, about some of her extreme beliefs. It's a very long testimony. It's extreme, but this is just a part of it. So Lori's attending now these preparing a people conferences and a vow. She's getting into it. She's, she's meeting, meeting people. She's meeting in these mm -hmm. little side groups mm -hmm. and starting to get indoctrinated into this new second and third tier Mormonism. Right? Correct. Correct. Prepper mm -hmm. Rexburg Mormonism. And in this point too, just to set the stage a little bit more, she's referring to some hard things in her life because they all have this backstory, right? So her backstory is she says that she was married to a man who was abusive and abused her children. We're just saying what she said. We're not saying that's true. She's saying this, and she's explaining what she, her where her mind went. Okay, if that makes sense. And Lauren, you can just tell us when to stop this clip. Okay. Okay. And of all those things, and after we were divorced, um, he told everybody that I was this lying, crazy Mormon, and got up in court and said all these. <laughs> horrible things about me and turned it around to where the judges believed him instead of me. And he was constantly trying to get custody of my three-year-old daughter and so just to rub it in my face. And um, I went through a lot of years of, of this kind of hard stuff and I was going to murder him. I was going to kill him. Like the scriptures say, like, Nephi killed it just to stop the pain and to stop him coming after me and to stop him coming after my children. And I was just, I just thought I couldn't take it anymore. And I would go through the scriptures and find all the things like if he comes against you once, if he comes against you twice, if he comes against you three times, then you can kill him. It says it in the scriptures. And <laughs> I'm like, there it is. There's my answer. I don't want to do anything that's wrong. I did not have a murderous heart. I just wanted to stop the bleeding and stop the pain. And so someone wise was speaking to me and said, you need to go to the temple. So I went and met my bishop and I was like, I'm either going to turn my life to the temple or I'm going to commit murder. So do you want to give me a temple recommend? <laughs> there you go. That I was good. perfectly honest because at that point. I okay. Wow. I, I've got something I want to say as a reaction, but I'll give you guys all a chance to, to mention. You don't mention it, I will. So, Mindy, it's do not you your typical tech, temple recommend interview, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm either going to murder my husband or give me a recommend. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't usually uh, Let's go, go for the way. temple recommend. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's see if that fixes your, your thoughts. <laughs> Lauren, what are your, Lauren, what are your reactions to that video? What's important to you in that video? The either or, the black or white, yes. the two extremes. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, talk about a lack of complex thinking. Um, I'm either trying to figure out a way to justify a way to kill this man, or I'm going to just need to really, really, really dig into my religion and religious extremism and start going to the temple all day, every day. But there, there's no in between here. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Good John. Point. Yeah, I, I think uh, you guys just stole a little bit of my thunder, but um, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's this, there's this, this binary type thinking, right? This either or thinking, and um, uh, you know, if we were gonna 
sit down and brainstorm if if some of if we were involved in some type of relationship strife or problems and we had to come up with a list um uh, and check some boxes about how to handle the situation i'm pretty sure that most of us would come up with more boxes than either murder or temple right <laughs> so um it's incredible to me that murder is the first box she's willing to check um <laughs> That shows me a couple of things. Um, she lacks cognitive flexibility, obviously. She's very <laughs> close-minded, right? So um, also, we, we kind of know, like, this is around the time she meets Chad. We know that murder is, she says she doesn't have a murderous heart, but maybe she has a murderous mind, right? Like, it's on her mind. It's on her radar, um, which is atypical. Well, well, that's, what, Dr. John, I, I want you to keep going with your flow, but I just have to interject. Where would she get the idea that murder in any case was justifiable within a believing, a believing in God, faithful Mormon context. So Can I answer us. that? Tell us. Yeah, yes, Lauren, go, Lauren. Tell us. Yeah. She mentioned it and, and I need to, I, I want to talk about this because it's really made me see this in a different light too. I was taught this growing up, the story of Laban and Nephi. And she mentioned that in the testimony. She started to, and she cut herself off. She if you hear Nephi it, she said, just, Nephi lay, just oh, like you know, I was going to kill just oh. like Nephi killed Lay, and then she kept Ooh, going. Yeah, yeah. And, but but it was absolutely her thought process. The Mormons, tell us what tell us what Nephi and Laban what she means for the non Mormons who've never read the Book of Mormon, chapter three, like in the first ten pages so of the, right the of the Book of Mormon. What what will that what would a reader find? I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commandeth, for I know the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save He shall prepare a way for them to commandment. I like I have this memorized from childhood. And that's Nephi or, or, knew yeah. that he could follow the Lord's direction and knew that he could accomplish by getting these brass plates and the Lord would find a way and the Lord delivered Laban drunk. So thus he killed him to accomplish what the Lord had commanded him to do. And I have this scripture memorized. It was scripture mastery that we learned in seminary yeah. and yeah it, even his song there's the song the lord commanded me fight to go and get the plates from the wicked laban inside the city gates laban lamb you were both afraid to try and if i was courageous this was his reply i will go okay that's enough of us well i'm proud to say i don't know the song i'm glad I can say that. No, but, yeah, the lord tells nephi in the book of mormon to go chop off laban's head so that he can get, there's no other way that God can use his power to get these brass plates that are so essential other than for Nephi to chop off Laban's head. And Nephi is the hero of the first half of the Book of Mormon. So that's where Lori would get the idea that murder was okay. If a spirit comes to you, if God comes to you, if you talk to Jesus anyway, and God comes to you and says, this, your husband is inconvenient, you now have spiritual license to commit murder. Is that, you know? Yeah. And I want to say this, I hope with all hope, and I don't know what's going, you know, that the, the LDS church stops putting an emphasis on this story. I really, I really. Or renounces that. it. Mm -hmm. Renounces it. Right. Yes. Tr Trent, a, a viewer says the Bible also has ample precedent for divinely sanctioned. Absolutely. Murder. Absolutely. Right. And, and I so would also say that and Lori's not the first. If you look at like the Lafferty brothers, if you go read John Krakauer's book, um, Under, Under the, the Banner, Banner of Heaven, Heaven, there have been lots of murders committed by Mormons, by believing Mormons, where the Laban story was used as justification. Yep. Yeah. And you don't need the Book of Mormon. You can just use the Bible. Anyway, sorry. Keep going, Lauren and Dr. Lauren, Dr. John. Dr. John yeah. yeah. Keep going, Dr. John. <laughs> so uh, I, I think, the singing though is is really going to dominate this segment so i don't i don't think we can ever top oh that goodness. but <laughs> thank you for that that was really that was a fine piece of entertainment i enjoyed it um oh, there's more. Uh, that's a tiktok that's a tiktok clip. oh goodness no. <laughs> dr john continue um so you know th this this is a little tricky but um I, you know that I would say that that from a psychological standpoint, that that Lori clearly has what we call an external locus of control, and that means essentially that she's she's getting motivated and kind of taking directions from things outside of herself. So in this case, religion or the temple or the Book of Mormon, whatever. Um, but all of that kind of leads me in the direction of of 
of also wondering um, to what extent does this woman have a moral compass or, or to go even further, like a conscience, right? Like if you're, if your conscience essentially, if, if, <laughs> if you need the temple or a bishop or the Book of Mormon or somebody to tell you that you shouldn't murder someone, then to what, what degree do you really have a conscience? And I, I think we're seeing some of that here. You know, it, it's, and by the way, a lack of a conscience is, is highly associated with psychopathy. So most psychopaths don't have a conscience. So um, I don't know enough about Lori to diagnose her. And actually, psychopathy is not really a diagnosis per se. It's not in the DSM. But, um, but, but I think we're starting to see some potential elements of psychopathy here uh, in this little speech. So um, is it, that is true? It, is it, is it uh, antisocial personality disorder? Is that the DSM? Yeah, anti, antisocial personality disorder is how the DSM tries to pick it up. But psychopathy is a very specific subset of that. Okay. So, you know, a, a roughly maybe 10%, 10 to 15% of people with antisocial personality disorder will have psychopathy. Got it. So although 75% of the people in prison would be diagnosed with psychopathy. So, um, so it, it, you know, this, this little segment we played, I think really reveals a great deal. If you, if you, if you kind of dig a little deeper and one of the most concerning pieces of that is that question I have about whether, uh, 